Yep. Good. Okay, get my laptop. Oh, yeah. Yo, excuse me. Let's hold it, Okay, so um, those of you who were with us at the last meeting, we were leading up into the, the ITU, the wicket, right? And um, there we go. And uh, there was a lot of talk about what we thought would happen, and there was a decent amount of rhetoric, and there was certainly uh, a lot of hypothesis being thrown around because it's such a closed ecosystem that most of us are unfamiliar with, and so that seems scary. Um, what we wanted to do was have someone talk to you who was actually there and who can get, you know, bring us up to date on what the goings on are. And what we need to remember is that this was just one more or less speed bump. This will happen again. We will have other regulatory bodies try to come in. We may uh, just as well have the ITU come back around again. And so uh, I'd like to invite Sally Wentworth up. Um, she is the senior manager of public policy at the Internet Society. Uh, before that, she was an advisor of the U.S. Department of State, and uh, I think she's uniquely qualified to help us nerds understand exactly what happened from a policy perspective, because this is important to our everyday lives. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. and. Uh Thanks for, um, to, the, to the NANOG Program Committee for inviting me to speak. And um, it's great to be here in Orlando, as somebody said. I flew in from Ohio, where um, it's considerably colder. So uh, this is a nice change of pace. Um, I hope you'll also uh, tolerate a little bit of a uh, more policy-oriented set of remarks, a little bit more formal. Um, we're talking about the wicket, which is formal by design. So um, if you'll, if you'll uh, keep up and put up with, with a more formal statement, then I hope um, at the end uh, we could have a, a more fulsome discussion of where we go from here. Um, so last year, Steve Feldman described NANOG as a whole bunch of people who work together and spend a lot of time arguing about stuff. Uh, that seemed like a particularly good jumping off point for, for my talk today, which is about the recent World Conference on International Telecommunications, or what we call WICIT, um, which is another place where a whole bunch of people came together to basically argue about stuff. Uh, the stuff people were arguing about at WICIT was pretty different than what you might see on an ANOG mailing list, but it's important to all of us. So uh, if you don't mind, bear with me as I tell you what happened and hopefully convince you about why you should care. The main agenda item for WICIT, which took place in December of this last year, was revising an international treaty governing telecommunications, things like interconnection of telephony networks and roaming for mobile phone rates. These days, policymakers in many countries are increasingly apt to put the internet in the same category as telephony and telecommunications. International treaty negotiation is layer nine stuff, but believe me, it has a lot of practical implications. But to jump into the details of what happened at Wicket without any context might create a narrative that's not that interesting and hard to follow. So I I'm going to start with a conclusion, a bit like jumping to the end of a chapter in a book, a much larger book, as somebody had already said. And if you see how this chapter ends, you might worry a little bit, because Wicket did not go well. I say this not as a citizen of one of the countries that chose not to sign the revised treaty. More on all the politics of that in a few minutes. But as a representative of a global organization, the Internet Society, whose mission it is to advocate for the things about the Internet that make it great. And I'll add just one other point, which I hope will resonate with many of you today. And that is that the things that happened in Dubai, although carried out as part of an intergovernmental process, all the Layer 9 stuff that you're so familiar with, these things could potentially have a lasting impact on the Internet's infrastructure and operations and on the content that's so fundamental to its value. The internet has flourished as a result of the collaborative effort of engineers like yourselves willing to set politics aside and put a borderless technology ahead of any national interest. People like everyone here in this room. And if it wasn't clear before the wicket, it should be clear now that it's unrealistic 
and maybe even irresponsible to assume that the internet can remain untouched by politics. For those in the internet community with their ears to the ground, Wicket had long been a concern. An early sign of what was brewing came in 2011 when China, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan approached the UN with a proposal for an international code of conduct for information security. The proposal included a line about curbing the dissemination of information that undermines other countries' political, economic, and social stability. Let those words sink in there for a minute. That wording set off a lot of alarms in the internet free speech community. The China-Russia proposal wasn't the first indication that countries have differing perspectives about the internet. Those differences have been evident as far back as 2003 at the UN World Summit on the Information Society in Geneva. And here we were eight or nine years later facing similar issues of internet regulation. At the Internet Society, we felt a responsibility to weigh in on the debate. We had a pretty high profile in the 18 months leading up to the wicket and used media, one-on-one -on -one meetings, public, public appearances like the one at Nanog back in Dallas to encourage policymakers to pay attention to what was happening. We did our advocacy everywhere we thought it would make a difference, from the scientific centers in Europe where the web had been invented to developing nations at the heart of the Internet's future growth. And of course, we brought our concerns to Washington. Last May, we testified before a House committee on Capitol Hill about the risks the Internet was facing from the wicket. All of this activity gave us a chance to reinforce the things that are enduringly great about the Internet. Many of the Internet Society chapters, we have over 90 around the world, got involved in informing local communities and policymakers about the importance of the multi-stakeholder process. This is the idea that the Internet's future path should be based on the input of individual citizens, industry, civil society, policymakers, groups like yourselves, engineers around the world. That's how the Internet has always grown, as opposed to its course being determined primarily or entirely by policymakers. 2012, as some of you who watch the policy space would also know, is the year of SOPA and ACTA, which were two very different regulatory events, but also experienced tremendous public opposition. So the wicket was taking place in this context, followed this political um, dialogue that was underway, and clearly was another threat that many of us recognized needed our attention. Wicket came at an incredibly important moment in the Internet's evolution. I'm not talking about the political gaps that became increasingly evident at the conference, East versus West, New versus Old, one system of political philosophy versus another, to some extent that was and is still noise. A far more substantive change is the rate at which Internet use is starting to grow in developing countries. There are 4.5 billion people who don't yet have Internet access versus the 2 billion that do. And as people in places like Lesotho or Uruguay or India come online, the internet is being transformed in ways that are hard to imagine, but will keep making it richer so long as those individual users have the chance. And the internet already accounts, as we all know, for more than $2.3 trillion of GDP in the, US 20 biggest econ in the world's 20 biggest economies. If it were its own economy, it would be the fifth biggest in the world, behind only the US, China, Japan, and India. And that growth is only dwarfed by what's happening in some of the less mature economies or emerging markets, where people are just getting online for the first time and experiencing the value that the internet brings to them. In Russia, the dollar value of online retail will rise by a factor of more than three between 2010 and 2016. Online retail will quintuple in Indonesia, Mexico, and Saudi Arabia. It will rise by a factor of almost six in China and a factor of 11 in India. This growth is coming from new users and the governments of those countries are starting to become increasingly engaged in the policy discussion. Technology is meeting policy. So Wicket, which started on December 3rd, was the venue chosen by the ITU for updating its International Telecommunication Regulations, or the ITRs. Since 1988, just as a recap, the ITRs had governed international phone calls and set guidelines for the relationships between international carriers. If we think back, traditional telecommunications in 1988 was largely dominated by state-owned operators. And there was a certain amount of logic to a treaty that would govern and spell out responsibilities and rights of each country, who paid for what and what was permissible. But it was our view that extending a telecom treaty to the internet is a little bit like putting a steel base around the roots of a tree and then telling that tree to go ahead and flourish. 
it isn't the environment that's needed. By contrast to the multi-stakeholder process, treaty making is a closed door activity, as was said earlier. Few outsiders or regular citizens have a chance to influence it, and, no one has a, and none of them have a vote. Instead, treaties are negotiated between nations and advanced through committees, with disputes being handed off to other com committees with different areas of authority, and those disputes being handed off to yet other committees with different areas of authority. This is ultimately what happened in Dubai. Um, if you look at this slide, this is a slide of voting in an intergovernmental meeting. I'll come to that in a minute. So during the very tense two weeks in Dubai, many of us, already wary about the nature of the proposals we'd seen prior to the conference, were faced with a host of last minute proposals for either treaty text or re resolutions that removed any hope that countries might tread lightly when it came to the internet or leave the internet out of the amended treaty altogether. Though a strong coalition of countries from around the world made it clear that they would not accept a, such a sweeping revision of the treaty, a new resolution related to the internet was finally adopted over the serious objections of countries like Sweden, Canada, the US, and the UK. This resolution proposed a much more prominent role for governments and the ITU on internet matters, with only a passing reference to the value and promise of multi-stakeholder policy development. From our perspective, this resolution in the ITRs shifted the emphasis from community and consensus to centralization through government action. Then, as the conference was nearing an end, something else happened to highlight the rifts between delegations. Countries became entangled in a highly political debate over human rights that resulted in a contentious vote. That's what you see here. You raise a paddle, you represent your country, one country, one vote. Oops, I think I'm missing a slide in there. So when the conference ended on December 14th, 89 countries signed the revised treaty, including China, Russia, the Commonwealth of Independent States, most of Africa, and virtually all of the Arab League. 55 countries decided not to sign the treaty, including the US, most of Europe, the Philippines, Japan, Kenya, China, not China, India, and Costa Rica. That's actually an important error. Um, it's important to note that some of the 55 countries that voted no may in the end decide to sign the final acts. There is a slide, and I'll uh, make sure it's available, that gives you a chart of how the different countries voted, at least um, in December in Dubai, um, recognizing, of course, that that chart is subject to change. So Wicket was over. The various delegations returned to their home countries to figure out what had just happened what it meant, and what we should all do next. And that brings us to the present and to the postmortem that we're doing today. Uh, for those of us who spent months preparing for Wicket and were in Dubai, it is important to look at the bigger picture. At face value, the treaty does not break the internet. Indeed, most of the worst proposals about routing and IP addressing and mandatory standards do not appear in the final acts. The new treaty does provide for greater transparency regarding mobile roaming rates and recognizes the fact, probably importantly to this group here, that interconnection and traffic routes should be determined by private operators. That was indeed up for debate in Dubai. However, there are, these are comparatively small steps forward. Looming bigger are concerns that the scope of the treaty, language on security, language related to spam, will ultimately place restrictions at a legal level or limitations on the internet at the technical level. And questions remain about which companies and which operators will ultimately be subjected to the legal scope of this treaty. We don't have answers on that yet. So what happens next? The new treaty doesn't go into effect until January 2015. Compliance with new regulations takes a while. So all countries and those that have signed the treaty and those that haven't have a couple years to figure out exactly what changes they might make. Unfortunately, the desire by some to give the ITU an operational role in the internet has not abated. So it's important to pay attention to the upcoming calendar of international policy meetings. It's still possible that governments are going to seek to give the ITU operational governance of things like IP addressing or standards or domain names or interconnection agreements. Among the countries that attended the wicket, there are clearly some that say, hey, look, 
what crosses my border, what traffic uh, is uh, moving within my country should be nationally managed and it should be nationally regulated. Of course, as we all know in this room, the internet has never worked that way. With the internet, a person using Skype or downloading music or sending an email doesn't know the path the data is taking to get between two points and nor do they need to. Any part of the network that draws attention to itself or creates friction in the movement of internet traffic raises costs and interferes with the experience. So in some ways, the debate at Wicket may have helped clarify the risk that, glo that the global internet could give way to a set of national internets with their own rules and gatekeepers and with higher costs for everyone. And if that ha happens, as we know, the platform will become more fragmented, fewer people will benefit from it, not clear it would even be the internet at all. So from the point of view of a timeline, the next major event is the ITU's Plenipotentiary Conference, which is on the, on the end there, um, in Busan, South Korea, in October 2014. This will be when the ITU will firm up the policies it outlined in the acrimonious last days of Dubai and put the ITU's strategic plan for the next four-year period into motion. But those of us trying to defend the idea of an open, decentralized global medium cannot sit on our hands and wait for Busan in 2014. There will be an important number of touch points between now and then, as this calendar reflects, including the I2 World Telecommunication and ICT Policy Forum this coming May on internet issues, and the I2 World Telecommunication Development Conference in March of 2014. More important, though, perhaps, are the efforts that we can all make including in communities like Nanog, to reach out and work with governments. Where we have opportunities to be involved, we need to take those opportunities because the alternative is the environment that I described in the slide below, Dubai, voting, member states. On the plus side, the wicket provided a great deal of insight that I think this community should pay attention to into developing country priorities with respect to the internet. Make no mistake, many of these countries want to become part of the information economy. At the same time, they have important questions and in many cases, legitimate concerns. They have concerns about the high cost of connectivity. They have concerns about privacy and consumer protection. They have a hunger for education in the areas of IP addressing and numbering. They have a desire to make smart infrastructure investments and to get answers to waiting questions around censorship and human rights. Fundamentally, they want their experts represented in technical fora like this one. And finally, these countries do appreciate the fact that the internet is different from the telephone system, although the push to bend the ITRs to accommodate the internet suggests that they don't really understand those differences in detail. And for the internet society, this is what's darkening the skies post wicket. So as we think about how we might influence what happens from here, it's important to start with a realistic picture of what's possible. We are not going to solve the tectonic rifts that in some cases exist between governments. Those are real, they are often geopolitical, and we are probably not going to make them go away. But what we can do is work with some of those countries in the middle. These are the countries, as I described, who have hard questions about how to take the core elements of the internet model, the bottom-up, consensus-based, community-based decision-making and apply that approach to hard issues like combating malware and spam and botnets or to bringing down connectivity costs in their countries. Oh, there's the wicket signatories. Good stuff. Um, on the list here, you can see a list of the issues that many countries newer to the internet brought up at wicket in one way or the other. Uh, so there is a concern, clearly, that a vision of the internet one that we heard at Wicket would subject the areas that you see on the screen here to more government oversight. Most of the things on the screen, the first four or five of them anyway, could be viewed as the nuts and bolts of the internet, and they have traditionally been handled by engineers. The risk, and in some cases the current reality, is that countries will look only to the ITU for guidance on these technical issues. The network operating community, including organizations like NANOG, the IETF, the organizations and companies that you work for, and many of you individually have the credibility, knowledge, and I believe the motivation to offer these policymakers another way of thinking about these problems. It's critical that we do that. Indeed, these dialogues are already starting to happen. 
Last year, ISOC arranged for policymakers from a number of countries, including Senegal, the Ivory Coast, Guatemala, Papua New Guinea, Thailand, Paraguay, and Lesotho to come to IETF meetings that were taking place around the globe. This is the photograph of the policymaking group that came to IETF Atlanta this last November. The policymakers in these countries face unique challenges. Their countries may have a single dominant telecommunication provider, an incumbent that owns much of the country's communications infrastructure, employs tens of thousands of people, and represents a significant source of revenue for that country. Whether or not these incumbent telecom providers are protected by legislation, and they often are, they have an enormous amount of power domestically. In theory, they might like the added revenues that would come from building up and expanding the internet in their countries, but they may not be in a rush to do so if it means increasing the com competition that they face in their home markets, which puts policymakers like these in a tough position. They have to persuade the incumbent telecom company to open the door to new entrances and new entrants and new services. In Kenya, for example, the government had to take a very tough stand vis-a-vis -vis the national telecom operator in order to launch the local internet exchange points. We now know that this act of courage was critical. The KIXP has transformed the internet ecosystem in Kenya, and the spillover effects of more investment, local content, and higher quality of service are quantifiable. By coming to multi-stakeholder events like the IETF, or the Internet Governance Forum, or the African Peering Forum, and engaging with the internet community, these policymakers have started to become more fluent in matters like how internet traffic is routed, how the domain name system works, or the economics of setting up internet exchange points. They are starting to use the internet technical community, the source of deep expertise and deep problem solving skills as go-to sources of information. This is what we want. So we, this here actually represents um, the participating countries in the 2012 African Peering Forum. And we've been pleasantly surprised at the receptivity of policymakers to attend meetings like the IETF or AFPIF or similar events. We expect 10 or more developing country policymakers to attend the upcoming IETF meeting this March back in Orlando, and others are set to join us at IETF Berlin and Vancouver. I hope some of you will be in a position to participate in a give and take with countries newer to the internet, whether at the IETF or different forum as the opportunities arise. It's a fascinating experience for both sides of the conversation. I think we, both sides of the conversation have something to learn from each other. So the bottom line is this, figure out where you can provide information and play a role and go ahead and actually do it. Remember, we are not home free by any means. If we don't step forward, there is still a risk that many countries will turn to sources of information that don't support the Internet's multi-stakeholder model and will make critical decisions on the basis of that information. So far, the Internet has been impervious to just about everything. Regulatory threats like Wicket and those that preceded it, a meltdown that nearly toppled the world's financial systems. Through it all, as we know, the Internet just keeps growing and evolving, and the expectations are for more growth. Between 2005 and 2015, the Boston Consulting Group expects global internet traffic to grow by a factor of more than 30. Forecasts show that 3 billion people will be on by 2016. That's 500 million more than are online today. So it's exciting to think about the new energy, the new ideas, the increased richness of the internet that will result from these new users. But keep in mind, many of these new users will come from developing countries, many of whom raise the concerns that we heard at Wicket. It's all interlinked. And the benefits will only accrue if the internet retains the qualities that it has today. Global reach, easy access, collaboration, and innovation without permission. So my personal hope is that we will one day look back on Wicket as a troubling chapter in a longer story that ultimately came out well, as opposed to signaling a negative turning point in the narrative of the internet. However, this is not a case where we can flip forward and see how the story ends. The story is ongoing. As was said earlier, it did not begin at Wicket, and it certainly doesn't end there. And we all have an obligation to shape where the story goes next. The collective good is dependent upon the contributions, ideas, and efforts of people and countries everywhere, including those of you in this room. So the stuff worth arguing about is happening, as I said, in some new places. 
but it's worth getting involved and it's worth being heard. So thanks for listening to a formal presentation um, and I'd be happy to help um, lead in a, a discussion or answer any questions that you might have about the wicket. Thanks. Do any questions from the floor? Anyone? Answered all the questions. It's amazing. Stunned silence. Can you, I think someone needs to turn the mics on, but. Yes. Sure. Sure. So the question was, what does it mean that the U.S. decided not to sign the treaty? What does that mean going forward? Um, I, obviously, the U.S. plus 55 countries chose not to sign, which means that we have a lack of consensus. So going into Wicket, there was a 1988 treaty that was basically the consensus for communications regulation. The absence of consensus, I think, means um, an increase in uncertainty in the regulatory market or the regulatory space internationally. Um, one of the things that it may signal, and again, not just at the US, but that these 55 countries that you see a schism or a rift between um, uh, countries that signed and countries that didn't sign. And what we're likely to see going forward is um, the consequences of that rift permeating future policy discussions. Um, I don't think the rift is clearly defined in North versus South, developed versus developing country, as you, as if you look back on the on the countries that signed the treaty, and I know I went fast on that one. Let's see one more. Yeah. Um, it's important so you can see the, the link down at the bottom. But I think the bottom line is it's uncertainty. Um, you have a major leading economy, um, major leading internet economy, that is not, uh, has chosen not to be part of this international consensus, and they took 55 countries with them. Um, that is going to have implications for the regulatory um, consensus going forward, for sure. Still no. Behind you, Tony. Is this, okay, this one yep. works. Uh, so you talked about getting it, getting in touch with these policymakers mm -hmm. and give, uh, Tony Tauber from Comcast. So the people who aren't as used to the sort of consensus-based um, uh, way of doing things that we might be, how receptive do you find they are typically? I mean, I, I would tend to think if they're policymakers and, you know, they derive their power and meaning from making policy in the way that they're used to, how receptive are they to sort of changing that all up? It's a tough change. I mean, clearly, I think if you look at the internet's impact on policymaking in general, not just related to telecom or communications, you see a considerable impact on um, the expectations of individual citizens in a country to uh, be involved, to have information about policy. If you're just looking at the, the US, you see that in things like um, political debates over health care or political debates over gun control or other major political issues. People expect the technology and pe uh, to facilitate more engagement and more involvement. That's a difficult transition for policymakers to make in general. It's difficult in the US, and it's difficult everywhere. Having said that, I think. Um, for many countries, they ultimately want more of this technology. And what we found in bringing um, the countries and the policymakers to the IETF, 
clearly not a negotiating forum, clearly not a policy forum. There's a real hunger for information on how things actually work um, and how they can factor that real technical information into their policy making. So I think there's a lot of receptivity. Uh, the problem is, is when you put a bunch of governments together in a negotiating environment, they do what they do best, which is negotiate. Um, and it's difficult to then make that process inclusive, which is, I think, why um, the more informative, the more educational, the more capacity building we can do, it might lessen the desire by countries to push everything into a negotiating environment. We can't be unrealistic about that. There's that remains a tendency and it remains um, a desire by certain governments and we'll still have to face that. Um, but I think we're at least somewhat optimistic about um, the desire by individuals in those governments to actually have solid technical information that they can work with. Hi, Suzanne. Hey, hi, Suzanne Wolf, I see. And in answer to the last question, um, I actually wanted to reinforce what Sally said in answer. Um, I've done a couple of these meetings that ISOC has facilitated with international policymakers at the IETF. And what Sally just said is absolutely something I've seen up close and personal many times now with these folks, where they realize that the internet and the way the internet currently works is a tremendous, tremendous benefit to them and their countries in every way they can think of. It's an enormous economic and social benefit. But because they have these long-standing policies that have control regimes attached to them, that have fees and taxes attached to them, where there, are, there can be really big revenue implications for how you know, some of these things, how some of the basic work of these governments gets done. With changing things, they really feel that they're caught in a bind. They really feel that they're trapped between the benefits of the internet and these policy-based costs that, that you know, people like us didn't take into account, and frankly, it's a good thing we didn't, or we wouldn't have the internet as we have it today. But these people really do need to reconcile these competing and, and contending concerns, and real information about how they can make those compromises, fit the technology together with those policy concerns, they're desperate for it. And they really do listen and really do change their positions and for a like wicket based on being told, wait a minute, you can actually work these things out, but you do have to spend some time and effort and really understand the issues and, and the contending priorities. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I think, you know, having been in this internet governance debate space for quite a while now, I think it's fair to say that the questions coming from governments are becoming more sophisticated they're, um, they're deeper in terms of what they're looking for, which reflects their, I mean, even at a personal level, it reflects more interaction with the technology than we would have seen five, 10 years ago. They're using Skype, they're using, you know, people are, this is being integrated into their everyday lives. So the questions are becoming more sophisticated um, and more challenging. You know, one of the proposals going into Wicket that a lot of us here were very worried about was, um, proposals that literally said the countries have the right to know exactly how their internet traffic has been routed and the right to regulate it in pursuance of national objectives. Um, I, I mean, that would have profound implications if anybody could actually manage to implement that as a, as a practical matter. But what they were saying is, is you know, they're merging this, this thought process from the telephony days into the internet and saying if it worked there, it should work here. I had the regulatory there, regulatory authority there, I should have the regulatory authority here. And if I don't, I need to understand it as, as a technical matter why that doesn't make sense. And we had some very, I think, productive conversations with people um, at the last IETF meeting about that very question where, you know, literally drawing on, on whiteboards and things and saying this is how things work had a real impact. They, they, people wanted that information. Hi. Hi uh, Daniel White with GlobeNet. Mm -hmm. So GlobeNet's a subsea cable operator. Um, mm -hmm. Traditionally provide bandwidth and uh, well, currently IP, but have never really provided telecommunications. We're really a, a, a bandwidth provider. Uh, so the question is, 
we're not currently subject to the ITP <laughs> regulations, and under the new regulations, we would now be probably uh, under some sort of bind for this. How do they see those new regulations affecting companies that are not currently telecom companies but are heavily IP based? Right. I think that's one of the the big um, unanswered questions, to be honest, coming out of Wicket. There was a very um, lengthy, very arcane debate about um, the definitions. Um, in a treaty, the, the definitions are very important in any regulatory structure. You have to define first that which you will regulate. So you need to know what, it, what the it is. And in this case, one of the questions was, what is the recognized operating agency? That was the term that was used in 1988 to talk about clear telecommunications providers or operators. And there was quite a significant debate about whether to expand that to include all operating agencies, which as we understood it would have swept in anybody providing a service to the public. Um, it was narrowed back from that broad approach, but it was in true diplomatic form, fudged a bit. And um, there's a question, I think, in the legal community now about how to, to take that language and interpret it to see to whom, whom it will apply to. The other complicating factor is, is that legal analysis may be done in all 89 countries that signed the treaty and they could possibly reach certain different conclusions. So you will have a, a plethora of regulations, which is you know fairly common. Um, so the short answer, it's ambiguous and we don't know for sure. Um, it's not as bad as we had feared going in, but it is not a clear cut case that you, for example, would be excluded. I think we, Susan? You hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan Martins from AT&T. I'm just wondering if, if um, some of us were interested in trying to help with the education that you think is needed, is there an obvious channel you see or there's some committees already there that would, would most, most easily do this or? Well, there's, and unfortunately, there's no single place to go. Um, we, um, you know, shameless plug, Internet Society does a lot of this work with many of you already in the community. And if there was interest in um, participating in that work to reach literally at the, at the community level in these countries, we would welcome that. There's a lot of work that um, the regional Internet registries do um, Aaron, I know, is here. Um, LACNIC does a tremendous amount of work in Latin America. Um, AFRINIC in Africa is a huge force um, in the internet community in Africa. So there are a number of touch points um, where different kinds of education, different kinds of information is being made available. Of course, the ITU is a source of information for a lot of these, con these countries. And, and one of the questions is how to get the right kinds of information, the right model into the ITU um, discussion or mindset to, to make that also a vehicle. I mean, at this point, um, it's very government driven. Um, but I think there's no one answer, but um, if this is something you're involved or interested in being involved in, I know a lot of us in the internet community would, would welcome the assistance. Thanks. And John is gonna come help me with John. that answer. Um, if I could add into that, John Curran, President and CEO of Aaron. Um, I think a lot of the ISOC's done a lot of work here, uh, which is really great. Uh, and the regional registries have also done some. On the Aaron webpage, if you go to the top menu yeah. that says participate and you pull down to internet governance, click how to get involved, mm -hmm. you'll see a list of the meetings and forums that we end up participating in. And we often end up getting called to these forums uh, some of them are things like OECD and CTEL and the Caribbean Telephony Union. And they'll say, we really need someone who knows how exchange points work, or we really need someone who knows how peering works, or we really need someone who understands what regulation of VoIP would mean. So um, those are topics that, you know, I'll, I'm happy to talk about anything you ask me about, but the quality would go up remarkably if people in this room were involved. So. 
You can go to Internet Governance, pull down, you'll see the forums mm -hmm. that we're going to, um, and we'd love to have more people get involved. Uh, if your company is in a situation where they can spare you to go to some of these meetings and participate uh, in meetings predominantly of regulators, but also other ISPs and carriers uh, on the ground, um, we'd welcome it. Um, so that's one way to get involved. Thanks, John. I, I think that's right, and just the, it's, it's good to have a, um, almost a repository of experts that can be drawn upon. As, as John said, there's a plethora now of meetings and events in which governments are asking these questions. And there are a number, a lot of people in the technical community that are starting to step forward as experts. The more that step forward, the less of a burden it is on everybody. We can share the collective um, uh, responsibility. And you will hear, and I think it becomes easier after the first engagement or the second engagement, you start to hear the kinds of questions. They, there's commonality in questions. There's um, a, that, that list that I had up earlier of the, of the um, concerns, you know, these kinds of questions here are ones that we see over and over again. This isn't the first time we've seen them. It's certainly not the last. So if you have expertise in a particular area, um, you know, engage with Aaron or engage with, with ICANN or with ISOC, um, you know, make, make us aware that you have this kind of expertise and are willing to, to be um, a resource. The more resources we have on the list of, uh, that we can um, tap into, I think the better. So I have a question from, from chat. Um, this this will be a little edgy, but on the uh, there there was recently a petition going around to defund the ITU. Yeah. Do I need to say more or, or no? No. What do you think about that? That's a complex issue. Um, I will first say, as a first order, um, the ITU is not. As some of us were talking about over lunch. It's not a single thing. Um, the ITU does a lot of different things. The ITU-T, which is the one many of us here probably interface with, is not the only part of the ITU. Um, the uh, radio communication sector is incredibly important for um, the spectrum and radio communication work that it does. The development sector is something that developing countries worldwide trust for information. Um, so while I think that that um, initiative, it might feel good as an instinctive matter. I, I think the message from Wicket is different. I think the message from Wicket is we have to be more engaged in the discussion. We have to do more to provide direction to the debate. Um, pulling up and going home feels good temporarily until this happens again. And I think one of the complaints that we hear sometimes from developing countries is that you know, the community, whether it's um, developed countries or big companies or whatever, only show up at the point of a threat. And then they don't deliver going forward. And so um, I'm not sure that um, uh, pulling up and going home is, is really the way to change the narrative. Hi, I'm um, Aaron Hughes. Uh, so I was just looking at all the perspective links, both on the Air and Internet Governance page and the ISOC uh, uh, Get Involved page, and it seems like you either need to become a member or attend on yet another meeting to, to get involved. And what I'm hearing from you is that you're looking for subject matter experts to raise their hand and declare themselves as available to be called upon. I think it would be a very useful exercise to put a very simple form together for uh, people like the folks in this room to volunteer for that kind of thing as not everybody has a ton of cycles to dedicate to going to additional meetings, but certainly will volunteer to be called upon as various subject matter experts. That's a great idea. I think we could do that. I also think, um, yeah, the, there's ways where you didn't have to physically go to a meeting. Um, we. For example, back um, this summer, we're looking at the proposals that came from um, certain countries to introduce a sending party network pays concept into the treaty so that the senders of traffic would pay to, um, to have their traffic delivered. Um, 
it took, a, a, I think, a community effort to really analyze <laughs> um, what that kind of proposal would mean. And so, you know, for people who can't get on an airplane or can't spend a week and a half at a OECD meeting or something, putting heads together um, um, electronically to think through um, some of these questions um, uh, and to write things and to contribute to analysis is also a really useful um, exercise and, and really helps to bolster uh, the, the information that countries that want to support you know, our way of thinking you know, have at their fingertips. So there's physical attendance at meetings. There's also the you know, bringing information to bear for um, people like me who, who have, go to these meetings on a, on a daily or monthly basis. Uh, Jared and then Patrick, and then we have to close the session. Great. Uh, hi, Jared Motch, NTT America. Hi. Um, I'm, I just wanted to comment to Aaron, and I, and I actually made the same comment in Dallas as well, I believe, is that uh, the State Department actually does a lot of the coordination for these agencies, and there's open mailing lists that are open for subject mm -hmm. matter experts, such as the ITAC list and other right. things. So if you need help getting in touch with the Secretariat of the list, uh, I'll extend the same offer I did in Dallas. I'm happy to make introductions to, you know, for people in the community. Uh, I have red hair, so I'm easy to find. Um, so as, as, aside from that, you know, if people are interested in participating in this, State Department is always interested in doing this. There's conference calls pretty regularly okay. as well. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I, you know, including, you know, uh, pre-planning conference calls that, that preceded Wicket as well, that went out to the ITAC list and other things. So it's a, definitely a valuable thing to engage, or if you have a government relations person to engage. But e even in the absence of that, I, I do recommend that you, you do participate. You can participate in some ways as an individual, but a lot of these things are state-to-state -state relationships as well. So it gets a little complex. You, you have to pay a little attention to the nuances. But I'm happy to make introductions. Well, and I, I think to that point, I'll just, um, we have a mailing list at ISOC as well that um, is, is more for global um, individual members or, or corporate members or whatever. Um, and that's actually been a fruitful dialogue so that a stakeholder in Kenya can ask a question to the list and you know, people in um, Australia or, or the US can, can help respond to that. Um, to that point, it is a point of encouragement, I think at Wicket, that we did see a lot of internet experts or, or people from the community on national delegations to the Wicket. Um, for some of them, it was a new and brave, it was a brave new world um, coming into Dubai where you know, people are raising yellow paddles to vote and things like that. But that kind of engagement on national delegations was incredibly important and something in all my time doing um, this kind of international policy work, I've never seen before. And I think that was because of the level of attention, the level of concern that was going into Wicket. But it's something that we shouldn't allow to drop off. Um, if, if we can participate in national delegations like the US or others, Sweden had some experts in the Netherlands, Kenya, the Philippines. There are a lot of countries that brought the internet community into their delegations. We should um, maintain that momentum to the extent that we can. Patrick, uh, as always, I'll give you the last word because you'll take it anyway. But uh, <laughs> like 10 seconds, please. We're way over time. Hi, Patrick Gilmore, Akamai Technologies. Um, just real quick about the petition. Uh, realize that the petition, first of all, specifically excluded uh, certain sections of the ITU. It did right. not try to defund the ITU period. It tried to defund, uh, I believe it was the ITU. ITT, yeah. Yes. And the reason you say it's not good to take your ho toys and go home, it's also not good to pump millions of dollars, as small as that sounds to the United States government, it's not good to pump millions of dollars into an organization where the Secretariat literally lied to our faces, pulled stunts that anywhere else except the United States Congress would be considered shameful, <laughs> and um, does nothing that we want them to do and does lots and lots of things that we want them not to do. So in my opinion, yeah, pull your toys and go home for that particular section. Yeah, that's a view that's certainly circulating in the U.S. right now. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. Um, don't hesitate if you have questions to get in touch. And um, as John said, there's the Internet Governance site on the Aaron page. There's a lot of resources on ISOC's page. 
um, get involved. Um, this isn't the end of the discussion. Thanks a lot.